All right. Well, thanks so much for having me today. I'm super excited to share my journey a little bit around a opportunity that I recently had at my company Optum to take a product that we were going to release and solely have as an internal product for our own developers in the company. And the journey that we actually took to end up open sourcing it and what it takes to be successful in that realm of having an internal product that might be productionized, but actually also having a component of it that's open source and kind of walking through a little bit of what that journey looks like. But I actually wanted to go ahead and start with a little bit of an icebreaker. I'm kind of curious for the people on this call, have you ever worked on something that might provide, provide value beyond the walls of your company? So curious to see if you've ever found yourself in a scenario where you were you know, working on something, but you kind of wondered in the back of your mind, is, you know, is this something that would be actually valuable beyond my company outside of that? Uh, you know, maybe it was a unique solution to a tough problem, an innovative, innovative uh, type of way to use tools that already exist, or maybe just a complete gap in the market. You find yourself wondering, wow, it'd be so cool to share this out. All right, probably, but they would not allow sharing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I'm gonna cover a little bit on that today too as well. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, thank you for the responses. As a follow-up then, for those of you that said yes, was any kind of path pursued to be able to share this information publicly? Um, so same kind of thing in the chat. Yes, no, kind of. Um, and you know, that could be anything from actually open sourcing it on GitHub to blog, you know, some kind of public type of information. Were you able to move forward with that idea? Just taking Taking a quick look at the chat. Um, oh yes, cool, very awesome. Not allow sharing, so that might be, you know, that might've been one of the big blockers to doing that as well. Um, perfect. All right, well, for the folks that were actually were able to pursue a path forward, I'd love to connect some time and learn a little bit more about how that worked. Um, but today I'm here to actually talk a little bit more about my experience with that talk. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and kick off the talk, just introducing me and the company I come with, Optum and share a little bit about a use case where we had an internal product that we wanted to open source and what, what did that look like? And I won't actually be you know, using this as a promotion for that product or anything, but just an example throughout on some of the steps that we took to be successful. And then diving into kind of the content for today, I'm going to talk a little bit about key steps that my team kind of followed and encountered throughout this journey that I think would be good to pass on for anyone that is looking at taking this kind of route forward. So talking about designing from the outside in, building it smarter, and then being able to launch prepared and successful. And then also I wanna add a little bit of time at the end too, to talk about what happens after the first launch, how can you continue to be successful? And then we'll wrap with a summary. And then if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in chat as we go. And then we'll, we'll save some time at the end to come back to those as well. Just want to start with a very brief introduction. So my name is Marissa Crosby. I am a product manager with Optum based out of Minnesota, AKA Silicon Valley. I've been with Optum for about six years. Um, one of the things uh, actually before taking on this role, I was a developer. So I've really found a lot of benefit in bringing that perspective into my product management practices, being able to understand and look at a scenario, not just from you know, the business needs, business and customer needs standpoint, but also from the technology as well. And how do you work to build a great product in harmony between your business and your technology? I'm also really passionate about women in technology, and I spend a lot of time uh, also working with Toastmasters, so working to help people find their voice and build networks within, within the company and abroad as well, too. Currently, within my current role, we're actually working on simplifying and increasing cloud adoption, so finding ways to make it easier to modernize what you're doing and move to the cloud, essentially. I had a really cool opportunity. It was about December of last year to do an open source launch at AWS reInvent with a product called Disposable Cloud Environment. And those are really cool opportunities. So I'm gonna be focusing a lot of today's presentation around what it took to get us up to that open source launch and then how do we continue on successfully as well too. And with that, it's really a product that helps developers get almost instant access into the public cloud and be able to to start learning, exploring, complete, uh, completing proof of concepts. So we'll cover that a little bit more. Uh, and then I'll just very briefly introduce Optum. So if you're familiar with United Health Group and United Healthcare, Optum is really the technology arm behind the scenes, kind of powering a lot of what you would think of as kind of the traditional uh, insurance or pharmacy benefits management, but really looking at 
the overall consumer experience, clinical experience, and then data and analytics is another big area that we do too, kind of partnering with universities and doing a lot of different research and things there, but ultimately really working to make the health system work better for everybody behind the scenes, kind of coming at it from the technology perspective. All right, so I wanna go ahead and start off by talking a little bit about an open source product opportunity that we recently had at Optum. And actually in order to do this, I'm gonna step back a little bit and do some storytelling. So <clears throat> we had a problem within the company around large scale public cloud learning environments. You might think, well, that's, that's really strange. Why would that be a problem? Um, stepping back a little bit, when we first started our cloud journey at this company within the last three, four years, what ended up happening was we created a process and a way to get access to enterprise approved accounts. And as part of that process, teams really had to demonstrate that they understood the responsibilities, heightened security, how this environment is really different from what you can expect from an on-prem uh, data center type of development. And that was really necessary to make sure that we, the teams that were moving forward you know, weren't putting the company at risk at a whole. They knew what they knew what they were doing. They were good candidates to be operating in the public cloud. But that learning model, that model didn't really work for teams that wanted to just learn, explore, maybe try a few things out, create a proof of concept and then throw it away when they're done. Uh, what ended up happening was these teams would be queued amongst other teams that we're waiting to get in line. So it would be a long wait to get into your account and then you would potentially get your turn to present your case and get into your account. And then that's when it, teams would often find themselves being denied because they don't know what they wanted to do in the public cloud and how they would do it successfully. But it was kind of a chicken, chicken and the egg problem. How do you create and offer learning accounts for people with a low bar to entry where we also have some extra kind of security in place as well too. So as we're learning and exploring the public cloud, um, it is really easy to make, you know, make mistakes as far as like security, cost control, budgets. And then a lot of times too, when people were done with their exploration, these accounts would just be left over uh, for a maintenance or operations team to clean up and take care of. So we were looking with, looking to and working with our cloud provider partners to really figure out how can we get some, some more functionality in place so that we can actually have accounts that are managed, but more so temporary and controlled that makes sense for people that we're learning. Um, so kind of the, taking the traditional product management type route, you know, are we gonna build it? Are we gonna buy it? Are we gonna outsource this? What are we gonna do? And we worked with the cloud providers and we found out that this, this need really wasn't on their roadmaps. Um, you know, they understood that there were some gaps in how people work and learn in the cloud, but it wasn't really on their radar to create something to solve this problem. So we actually decided to go ahead and build out this solution. And we worked really closely with our cloud providers to have the conversation around, you know, if we were to build this, how do we make it successful? What do we need? How is this gonna line up with a long-term roadmap? And this, so through this process, we worked really closely with AWS. And as we were talking to some of their customers and kind of finding out some of the needs that they had, the question came up, well, do you wanna open source it? Everybody just keeps asking, can they just have this? So that really opened up the whole new realm of possibility for the team thinking about what it would take to offer this as an internal product, but also with an open source component as well too. And initially that just opened up the door to a whole lot of different challenges and things that we had to tackle. So the first off, it was really a new space for delivery teams. We are pretty confident with how we build, deploy, manage and handle technology within the company for you know, internal customers or maybe even external customers but we really weren't sure how you would do an open source component to this other product as well too. And then, like I mentioned, this was a big need within the company to get people ramped up and learning in the cloud quickly. And so we had already actually started an internal implementation that we weren't planning on open sourcing. So we had to figure out, okay, what does that mean? Is this worth it? Um, and then with the offer to open source as well too, AWS had asked if we would like to launch it at their reInvent conference. So we had just a few, few months to really finalize the details. Um, but after we continued talking to other people with interest, we realized, yeah, this, this is worth it, let's do it. And then that, at, that led naturally to a lot of questions on what are you doing and why are you doing that? So I wanna start by clarifying a little bit what I'm talking about when I say an open source product. So I'm talking about going beyond just consuming or contributing to projects upstream or bringing them into your current technology. I'm actually talking about designing and building a product with 
the intention to eventually open source the software, the code itself. And that could mean, you know, depending on what your team, your company's goals and ambitions are, that could actually mean building and moderating a public community in addition to managing your own internal offering, which is really kind of a new model for teams to try and wrap their head around. And the other area that makes the open source product more successful is if you're actually thinking about it from a product mindset as opposed to a short-term IT project. So you want to make sure that when you're thinking about, you know, is this something I would want to do, you have a long-term plan. You want to continue delivering value and evolving this product. It's not something that you would want to kind of build quickly, put on the shelf, and then have you know, never have, never touch it again. That, that wouldn't really be the kind of scenario that we're talking about here. So once we got that figured out, a little bit about what that would look like, I had to answer a lot of questions on why. Why would this be worth the extra effort to a development team? And ultimately, it came down to leveraging the benefits that come with open source in combination with product management best practices will actually help drive more value for your product. Uh, and the reason behind that is a lot of the good, the good things that come with a strong, successful open source community are the things that you're already going to need to be successful in product management. You want that continuous feedback. You want your technical implementation to be really solid, quality, extendable. You want your developers to be happy, engaged, motivated, ready to build the next feature. You wanna keep pace with industry trends. And ideally, if you have a community that's healthy and engaged on the open source side, they're gonna maybe help you with some of the things that you're excited about as far as enhancements or bug fixes. So throughout this presentation, I'm gonna hit on areas specifically where you could see some of these benefits, but that's ultimately what we, why we decided to move forward with open sourcing what we were doing because we really just saw so much benefit kind of harnessing that community. And then if that wasn't enough of a reason, a lot of studies have really shown that institutions that fail to engage with open source will fall behind those that use it effectively. And coming from a more of a product management mindset, I see engaging with open source as more than just like we talked about before, consuming, contributing, but actually starting to think about open source as your product model. How are you going to build and launch a product open source? Does that make sense? How can you get more value out of what you're doing from that product perspective by adding an open source component to what you're doing? So with that, I wanna talk about some key steps that our team used to be successful in this area and how following through these steps actually can help you maximize your product, your product input. They talk about designing from the outside in, building smarter and then launching prepared. And not to be a downer or anything, but before we go into designing from the outside in, I do wanna add a little bit of a disclaimer. One thing that I have noticed within the enterprise is that uh, you know, sometimes open source is definitely has a lot of myths that go with it. Um, it it's not going to be a magic solution to understaff development teams. Um, yeah, it, this is actually going to be a commitment above and beyond what it would take to traditionally deliver and launch a product. So you want to make sure that your teams are staffed appropriately and ready to be successful in this area. So by taking the core of what you're building and open sourcing it, it's not going to maintain or productionize that solution within your company. It's kind of an extra thing to think about and gain value from. And then similarly, community activity is also going to be heavily influenced by your moderator team. And if your team is stretched really, really thin and can't contribute the time that they need to keeping this open source community thriving and successful, you're gonna see that that community just kind of falls off as well too. So you wanna make sure that you're really aligned and planning for the long term. But okay, let's say you have that all checked off. The first thing that you really wanna do in this area is think about the, the problems that your product is going to solve. Having a good understanding of who you're targeting and why and what do you hope to achieve, but then starting to understand a little bit more about what's going on outside of your organization. So leaning on some of those, you know, whether it's a vendor contact or any kind of information you can get from folks on the outside to see how similar your problems are. And if you're looking to consider, should, should this product go open source, you're gonna wanna see where that overlap is and try and focus in on that and determine if you have a valuable enough use case and scenario to really move forward and put the effort into making this successful. And ideally, as you continue this activity, make more connections, you're gonna hopefully see that those two circles are gonna overlap a lot. And that's gonna indicate that you have a really strong opportunity that a lot of people would be interested in and it's gonna be successful to get off the ground. 
going back to the product disposable cloud environment that we launched, we knew at the very high level that there were limited options for cloud provider solutions at scale. We knew that was a problem. There wasn't a whole lot of support there, but as we started talking to people more and more, we realized that the feature set that we needed was also the same feature set that people outside of our company needed as well too. The ability to control costs, the ability to access it quickly, reusability of some of these accounts, some of the flexibility around how you work with it, how you deploy it. All of these things we realized came together really, really nicely and made a strong open source uh, story to tell. So we decided to go ahead and move forward with that based on that analysis. Uh, but going back a little bit, you know, why would you take the time to start this activity and do this? What, what value is this going to give you for your product in the end? And ultimately, it's starting to build your community early. It's almost like marketing before it's ready, getting people excited and interested in what you're doing. And you're going to gather some of the fresh perspectives and feedback early to, gather, to really understand how you can take your product to the next level. Um, similarly, you'll get more pulse on industry trends as well, too, being able to have an understanding of what's out there and what people are looking for. And this is an activity that actually continues across the product life, life cycle to make sure that you continue on the same path there. And then next up, so after we did our initial design analysis, figured out you know, who we're targeting, what features do they care about? That's where we realized pretty quickly that taking this approach really flipped the traditional product and how it's developed on its head. So thinking about Traditional products, your end users are going to be consuming the features that you provide. There's probably little or no engagement with your delivery teams and some of your implementation choices are likely gonna be obscured. People will download the technology, download the app, work with it. They're not gonna know how you deploy it, how you test it. And then similarly to any time that you have problems or you would like a feature request, those often will go through a formal process where then product and team and engineering takes a look at it, you know, breaks it down, determines it, adds it to the roadmap, releases it on a fixed schedule. But what you're gonna see by having an open source component is that your end users are actually now going to be developers and testers of the product. Um, you're gonna have potentially direct communication with your delivery teams, especially if it's the same team kind of doing that moderation activity with an open source. So you wanna make sure that your implement implementation choices are really solid, that you're not trying to hide any bad technical skeletons in the closet, uh, because in this, in this type of scenario and operating model, it does matter. Uh, and with that too, enhancements and issues um, can be added and talked about at any time. So making sure that you have a solid process in place to understand how do you handle that and how do you work on that. And then another big area that was really interesting for my team too was the, the parallel implementations, trying to understand a little bit about what does it mean if you have functionality that you don't wanna open source, but your team still needs it in their, your company still needs it in their production implementation. We realized really quickly, this can lead to a whole bunch of things that teams are gonna to have to figure out. Um, but really kind of going back to the, why go through this activity of building smarter? Um, overall, it's just going to help you have a higher quality software, higher quality software overall, but just looking at that implementation, making sure that you have flexibility in your product, that you can work around some of those requested features. And then the community lift out as well is a really big one, um, being able to understand how to funnel that through and how to bring that back into your team. And then keeping pace with industry trends was another one that was really big too. Um, you know, if you are using something in your open source repository that's maybe very out of date, not good practice, you're either going to hear about it in an issue or people are just going to go away and think that you aren't really ready. This product isn't worth their time to continue working with. So it's really important to actually think more about what is the technical implementation technology behind the scenes and not just the delivery of those features. Uh, what item, one thing I can add here, kind of going back to my example with disposable cloud environment was around the increased flexibility. So if we think about the implementation that we wanted to provide to developers within Optum, they would access public cloud accounts and use them for their learning activities. But they really weren't going to be deploying a system to manage these accounts. They were really just using those features. So as we talked to people outside of the company that were actually looking to be administrators of this system, really kind of following the core of what we were trying to do with the open source, 
they cared a lot more about how you deploy this product. And there's a lot of strong opinions around which type of technology to use. And our team had the choice of using an in-house system like that we would use for deployments or going with something a little bit more cloud native, a little bit more open source friendly so that we could support the people that would really actually care more about deploying the system, which would be our open source users. Um, so we did decide to go ahead with that other choice that was a little bit more open source friendly, cloud native. Um, and that just helped us overall with increased flexibility in the future, being able to provide multiple ways for administrators to deploy this system. And that was something that before we started doing this activity, we hadn't really thought too much about because it wasn't, wasn't kind of as important as once we started realizing feedback from open source as well too. So again, really just the quality implementation and flexibility are gonna be driven by being able to build it smarter than you would otherwise. All right, launching prepared. So we did our design, we did our build, and then we were ready to launch at our AWS reInvent event. And this is where I really wanna emphasize that you don't wanna underestimate the small stuff that goes along with trying to bring a product out to the public and into the market. So one of the first things that you really wanna make sure you have a good handle on is your open source strategy. And you can do this the same way you would with any other type of product management. You know, what are your KPIs? What do you wanna get out of this product? Do you care about number of pull requests, stars, issues, forks, unique contributors? Trying to figure out a little bit about what's gonna, what success means for this initiative and making sure that you're ready to handle it when people actually have um, pull requests and, and, and issues that they wanna bring into this product understanding that you're ready to handle that community growth and adoption are going to be really, really successful. Really something you're going to need to be successful going into kind of the next phase after your first launch. And the other two, you know, it seems kind of simple, but you wouldn't you definitely wouldn't want to forget it is your product name and legal and IP. And this really just gets down to making sure that what you're putting out in the open source world, on behalf of your enterprise, really meets what they expect for corporate compliance. So this is where if your organization has an open source program office, we definitely recommend leaning on that as much as you can, making sure that your, your name meets branding guidelines, it's not already used, you're using a license that's appropriate for what your, what your company wants to achieve in the open source space, really just checking all those dots definitely far enough ahead of time. Um, with that too comes another look at security and what you're building and putting out. You wanna make sure that Especially if you're following a scenario where maybe you started building a product and then decided to open source it, making sure that you don't have anything within that code base that could potentially be confidential that you wouldn't want to release out to the public. So there's a lot of different compliance checkpoints that you want to make sure that you follow um, before just releasing it on behalf of your company that you come with. And then exceptional documentation is huge as well too. And that really just gets into the positive first impressions. Um, you know, I think typically there's a little bit of a culture within the enterprise of the documentation is good enough. Well, good enough doesn't really cut it in open source. If you, if your users can't figure out how to deploy this system that you've put out there, they don't understand how to work with it. They don't understand how to contribute to it. It's going to be really hard to keep people interested and engaged and build out that, that community of feedback that you really need if they're kind of turned off from the whole thing right away because they couldn't get through the documentation. One of the things we did leading up to our public launch was we actually had some of our early, early testers, early adopter folks try deploying the system that we had put out there. We wanted to see how long did it take from start to finish to be able to stand this up. And we had set you know, a threshold of like, if it was more, more than an hour, the documentation and the way that we had set this up was not good enough. And we went back and we continued to do that activity, refine the documentation until we got to a point where people felt that, yes, I, I can come into this, this open source repository, understand what I'm doing and be up and running very quickly. Uh, we, you know, we thought that if it was gonna take days or weeks that we really missed the mark. We needed to make this simple as possible. So looking at documentation, how thorough is it? Does it include everything from testing to security to standards to deployment, covering all of that, and then even automating some of those documentation processes will also definitely be worth it in the long run as well too. All right, so we did our first launch and it was great and we're done, yay. No, just kidding. Um, actually going back, to my earlier slides around product management, 
the first launch is really just the beginning. You now actually have to go back through and repeat all those steps that you had done before, making sure that you are adjusting the changes in the market, capturing the latest problem that's the most interesting, uh, really continuing to feed this community and in this initiative. Um, so as you're doing that, it's gonna be really important to make sure that you take care of your development team. This is, this is different than building a traditional product. One of the first ones that my team hit on pretty quickly was establishing communication boundaries. Um, so kind of going back to that, the scenario of what it's like to develop inside the enterprise versus out, you know, sometimes people or uh, developers on teams would have conflict over GitHub pull requests or issues. I mean, one person saying, no, I think it needs to be this way. Somebody else says, no, I really think it needs to be this way. Um, you wanna be careful with that kind of communication when you have an open source product. You don't wanna erode trust in what you're doing. You want your contributors to feel that your core team is aligned, has a plan, and is moving towards that plan and isn't just you know, fighting in, in total chaos. So one of the things that we recommended for our team is you know, making sure that we have communication like that offline on our own internal chat tools and that we present a unified strategy or approach to any of our contributors coming to the open source side as well too. And then the other one was remembering that negative feedback is not failure. Actually, any feedback we get is, is a win in the product world. We're able to learn more about how our users interact and work with our product and be able to act upon that information. Um, so I think that's another thing too, where you look at the differences between traditional development and doing like more of an open source product development, those issues and problems and bugs are gonna be a lot more in your team's face. And you need to make sure that you have the right kind of mindset and process and, and just positivity to be able to handle that. Uh, one example that we had for our product was after our initial launch, we had done you know, a series of small improvements, things we needed to work on. At some point in that process, a bug was introduced and our team had missed it throughout our testing. And somebody had commented on, and actually I think they created an issue on GitHub and they had said, hey, this is, this is a problem for me, this broke. And the team you know, immediately was like, oh, we, we failed. We, we, didn't, you know, we didn't succeed. And it's like, no, you actually were able to get the feedback early that something wasn't working and now we were able to fix it and move forward. Um, so that's just a benefit. It's, it's almost like a double-edged sword. A benefit of open source is that you're gonna have more visibility into that information. You'll be able to get it quicker. You just have to be able to understand how do we handle it and move forward and treat that as a success and a chance to learn. And then finally, embracing DevOps was the other, um, other piece that I think has been really critical to our team's success. So looking at from a cultural perspective, making sure we do small but frequent updates, building in automation where it makes sense, um, looking at opportunities to have better insight into our system and, and bring some of those dashboards and insight and automation, all the good things that come with DevOps forward into our product. And then also releasing some of that functionality too for some of our end users that were interested in actually kind of deploying, deploying the system overall. Um, and so kind of like I mentioned, going back to one of the previous topics as well too, uh, we decided to actually release, uh, do all of our documentation automated so that you could just at any point, if there was any problem, you can update the docs, site redeploys itself, super, super simple. So trying to make sure that we can keep all of our end user information up to date and working without putting too much stress on the team to be able to do that. And then automated releases are another good one too. Um, where you can definitely leverage a lot of the benefits and tooling there. Um, because as your product continues to gain more users, you know, sometimes you're gonna find as it grows, kind of grows over that product lifecycle curve, um, you know, things are gonna change. Your, your market problem might change, your, your target audience might change a little bit. How do you develop your system in a way that the automation can be smart and, and adjust to that and be able to still serve you as your product grows and changes? All right, so bringing it back, I'll kind of go back to the beginning just a little bit. So one of the main reasons why or how you can maximize your product's input or your product's impact is by leveraging the benefits of open source in combination with product management best practices. So really working to build up that community where you can get the continuous feedback, you can learn more, understand your users and then keep building your product in a way that it can continue to evolve and adjust with that new information. With designing outside in, one of the things we talked about, making sure you have organizational support and alignment 
for an open source of product initiative, and then making sure that you have a strong opportunity that you're actually chasing. And really the main way that this is gonna drive more value for your product is by building that community and that feedback early on in your process. The next one we talked about was building smarter. So end users are now gonna be part of your development team. And how do you handle that? How do you make it easy to test your product? How do you make it easy to deploy it, understand the code? Um, thinking about what you're doing very holistically and not just from the features that end users use perspective. And really the main, how is this gonna help impact your product and drive, drive value? It's gonna help encourage a uh, high quality flexible implementation that you can keep adding and adjusting things to as your community grows and changes. And then finally, launching prepared. So we talked a little bit about having an open source strategy, making sure you check the right boxes on compliance, legal, IP, providing strong documentation. And really how this maximizes your impact is you're gonna jumpstart your community. You're gonna get people interested, passionate about what you're doing and hopefully convert them into long, long time users of your product where you can continue to pull on them for that, that feedback, that insight as it grows and evolves. You really wanna make sure that you're capturing people on that, on that first visit into your, your GitHub repository and making sure they're interested and they can understand everything that's going on. Well, those were the three items that we talked about kind of throughout the process as we designed our open source approach, built it, and then launched it. And then finally, moving forward. So some of the things we talked about were establishing communication boundaries, making sure that People, under, the team understands where they can have discard and how they can present a strong and unified strategy to their community. Remembering that all feedback is welcome and encouraged and a chance to learn, building in the right processes and ways to take in those bugs and then make the fixes, release them, ask for help from the community. So all things you're gonna need to be successful going forward. And then embracing DevOps. So looking at opportunities where you can bring in more tooling, more automation, having a culture uh, with ops in mind as you're building out some of these new features, how, how do we support them? How do we make sure that we're building something that we can support within our own company, but also make sure that other people can also take and support within their own company and be successful on what they're doing over there. So always looking for opportunities to improve that culture and then looking at small but frequent updates was the main thing on that one as well too. All right, so that's what I have for content. Uh, I wanted to switch it over to chat and see if anybody has any questions. Hope this was helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Marisa. Um, we have one question at the Q&A. Uh, I'm gonna leave that for you. So which building blocks and licensing did you use? AWS and GPL, and you did not open source all of your code, correct? Awesome, yeah, so that's a good question. I think we went with, um, let's say it's just a generic like Apache open source license. Um, so we have, as far as looking at the cloud providers that we use, um, the scenario that I talked about today with uh, open source was definitely more on the AWS side. Um, but yes, as part of doing this, this product and going with an open source route, uh, we did not release all of our code. And I think some of that, some of the code that we chose not to release was things that were more kind of internal to our company. So we, we have this product that we've released, you know, the core functionality open source, but we apply extra kind of security controls and policies on top of it in our own internal uh, corporate environment. So those were some of the things that we had taken out as far as, um, you know, we don't wanna let people in on information as far as you know, how we're securing our environment, what, what policies do we apply? Uh, we also do um, a corporate chargeback as part of the process as well too, where we can actually charge back to individual departments for their utilization. And that was something that we didn't really get a lot of interest from as we were doing kind of that market analysis. And so we chose to kind of keep a lot of that functionality in our internal implementation as well too, because folks really weren't asking for it. And it kind of revealed a little bit more on how we, we do some of that processing behind the scenes to our company. Um, so yeah, that, that's a really, really big area that you'll want to consider if you, this is a route that you want to take, where do you draw the line between public information and not public information? Awesome. We still have some more time for any new questions.
I really liked your talk. It was very good, very, very, very well in sequence, and the slides were really, uh, really good. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no, it was a it was a really fun experience. It was really cool to see, um, you know, what teams can do when you give them the, the kind of the power to open source and work on things uh, publicly as well. So kind of kind of cool to see the benefit internally and, and on the public side too. Swift signal um, Well, we have some time too. If there aren't any other questions. Um, Kind of curious for some of the folks that answered yes, they were able to move forward. Uh, what did what did that look like? So Brent wants to ask: Did the management have issues with losing competitiveness to similar agencies? Um, losing competitiveness to similar agencies. Um, could you? I, Clarify that one a little bit. Um, I'm totally sure what. Can you hear me? Oh yeah. Um, g giving your your solution away could be a competitive uh, loss um, to to others that might be um, using that. Um, so I didn't know if there was any objections that you had to overcome when starting this project. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, absolutely. <laughs> that, that was one that uh, came up quite a bit and where we ended up determining, you know, based on what we were doing, uh, being able to get kind of that feedback and community from the public was a bigger, a bigger win than the risk of sharing what we were doing publicly. So I think, you know, as we think about options for um, commercialization, you know, how would you actually take this product and make it something that you could sell and promote? Uh, we had, you know, we had looked at other areas where, you know, maybe it's the corporate chargeback, some of those things that were really specific to our company, maybe would be an opportunity for more, you know, being competitive in the future with like a paid offering. Um, but we really tried to focus in as much as we could on the functionality that was um, widely requested in our market analysis and just building that out and getting the feedback there ended up being um, a lot, a lot more of a win than I think the, the concerns that people had behind the scenes. Cool, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. So we have a couple of more minutes if anyone has any last set of questions. Where are you based out of Marisa? Minnesota. So kind oh, of the okay. uh, Twin Cities area. Yeah. It's been snowing yeah. all day, <laughs> steadily. <laughs> I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. How's the weather over there? <laughs> yeah. So, so did you ask how is how is everything here? Oh yeah, yeah. How's the weather over there? We're in the snowstorm here in the Midwest. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're just, it's it's starting to get cooler now. We are seeing fall. Oh, okay. So definitely better than before. Uh, we can go out and spend some good time outside the lake and beach. I'm on the NC State campus. Um, it's kind of good, uh, good, good area with good lakes and uh, trails, and we have mountains. Oh, um, nice. And this is fall season, so uh, definitely have to get on the mountains for to see the colors. Uh, very close to the Blue Ridge, Blue Ridge Park, Asheville. Oh, very cool. Yeah, um, where we're at here in Minnesota, if you go along the North Shore by Lake Superior, same kind of thing. Fall colors were, were gorgeous. <laughs> Probably buried now under snow, but <laughs> definitely. Yeah, this time of year. Yes, uh, all the sessions are getting recorded. Uh, I'm not sure when it's going to be available, or maybe just after this, after the whole track. 
gets completed, you should receive a link on your registered email address. All right, I thank you again uh, for such a wonderful talk and to be a part of ATR 2020, Marisa. Uh, I wish you a good week and uh, yeah, and enjoy your rest of the day. Awesome, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for attending. Uh, feel free to reach out um, on my bio if you wanna connect at all on LinkedIn or anything. Um, yeah, hope it was good. Thank, thank you all. Have a good first of the conference.